One of the biggest mistakes I made as a rookie every time I had seen frozen copper lines was to immediately hook up my gauges thinking I was low on refrigerant. Low levels due to a leak is very common. It is not the only reason why copper lines freeze up. So I'm going to walk you guys through a troubleshooting process every time you see frozen lines so that you don't make the same goofy mistakes I did. Now the one thing you can bank on whenever you have frozen lines is that we have a low pressure situation in our refrigeration cycle somewhere. Now low refrigerant can be one cause of that, but another cause of this is a restriction in the flow of refrigerant in the cycle itself. Another possibility is improper heat exchange between the air we're trying to cool and the refrigerant. And this usually boils down to an airflow problem. Now airflow is always the first thing I start troubleshooting in these kinds of situations, but before that, I will usually pull the disconnect on the outdoor unit just because I don't want the compressor running under those circumstances anyway. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the air filter. Now I've never found lines freezing over just because the filter was a little bit dirty, but I have found situations where the filter was so dirty it collapsed under the pressure and was found slapped up against the evaporator coil. I've had other situations where there was no filters at all and so much dog hair was on that evap coil that no air was flowing through it. Now after checking the filter, the next thing I want to do is go to the thermostat because our thermostat is the main control device of the entire system. So it's pretty common for it to be at the root of problems. And what I want to do is I want to test the thermostat to make sure it's working properly. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put it in cooling mode. Now with my disconnect pulled on the outside unit, only the air handler should turn on at this point. And so once it's in cooling mode, I'm going to go to the air handler and I'm going to check to make sure the blower is actually running. Now you don't want to do this by getting lazy and kind of putting your hand up near the vents because if your evaporator coil is completely frozen over, you're not going to feel any airflow. So you actually want to go to the blower itself, make sure it's spinning. Now, if your blower's not turning on, there's a few possible reasons for this. One could be the actual thermostat itself. So it, while you're at the air handler, what you can do is you can just test the Y terminals and the G terminals. Make sure you're getting 24 volts on both of those. And the reason why I tell you to check both is because some systems will activate the blower on that Y signal. Some do it just on G. So testing both is always going to cover you. If you find you're lacking voltage on either one of those, the problem most likely is the thermostat. Now, another possible reason is that you have a permanent split capacitor motor. Uh, you could tell because there will actually be a capacitor mounted to the side of it. What you want to do is you want to go ahead and turn your power off, disconnect the wires, discharge the capacitor by running screwdriver across the terminals, then go ahead and doing a microfarad test. These capacitors usually have a little data label on the side of them that tells you what your tolerance is and so you can tell whether that capacitor is good or bad. You can also have an ECM motor. You do want to verify you're getting your high voltage to the motor and a low voltage communication signal and this can usually lead you to either a problem with the control board or a problem with the control module on the blower or even the blower itself. Another unusual possibility could be something like a collapsed duct line, like a main trunk, especially on the return side. Can't say I find that too often though. Now at this point, if you haven't found any airflow problems at all, you do want to wait until your evaporator coil completely defrost. You don't want a sheet of ice on there because that sheet of ice itself is an airflow problem. Obviously air is not going to flow through it. So you do have to wait for everything to defrost. But once the system completely defrosts, we can now check and see if we have any restrictions in our refrigeration cycle. At this point, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put the disconnect back in. We're going to hook up our gauges and then we'll put the system back in cooling mode. And the first thing we want to do is we want to compare the high side and the low side manifold pressure readings. Now, if both of your pressures on both sides seem a little low, then that's usually a good sign you're low on refrigerant. However, if you see a really low suction pressure with a really high head pressure, that is a very good indicator you have a restriction in the refrigerant line somewhere. Now this could be a kinked line, although I don't find that to be very common. That is one possibility. Another possibility would be a plugged up filter dryer. Now if you're by the outdoor unit anyway, that's usually where the filter dryers are found. If not, they're usually in by the air handler, uh, but it's very easy to test them. You just make a temperature test on both sides of the dryer and if you see temperature difference on both sides that's usually a good indicator of a clog. And then of course there's a TXV that may be getting stuck in a closed position or throttled down. 
Now I found on a couple of occasions the reason why the TXCV was throttled down is because the sensing bulb was located inside the cabinet with the evaporator coil and the insulation was not on it. And so the cold air was hitting that sensing bulb causing the TXV to throttle down and it was basically starving the evaporator of refrigerant. Uh, when you get a really low pressure, you get really low temperatures and that's causing the freezing. So one little trick a lot of guys do is they'll warm that bulb up with their hands or they'll pull it outside of the evaporator coil um, just to sit it in the warm air. And then you go recheck your pressures. If your pressures start to normalize at that point, that's probably your problem right there. Then of course, you can always be low on refrigerant due to a leak. And usually if it is a leak, I find nine times out of 10, the leak is usually at the evaporator coil itself. Once in a blue moon, I'll find a leak out by the condensing unit, uh, usually by the service port valves or something like that. But outside of an actual nail in the copper line or something, that's generally where I'm going first to look for a leak is up at the evap coil. Everybody's got their routine, but that's generally how I go about doing it. Develop your own however you see fit. But these are all the things that I'll check long before I ever come to the determination that I need to add refrigerant to this system.